Hey everybody, this is Dan with Pain Free You, and today I have the pleasure of sitting with Rachel Whitfield from Bristol, UK, and um, she had heard a little bit about some of the successes that I've posted about uh, this thing that's being called Long COVID, and uh, she reached out to me, to me and volunteered to share her story with that, and kind of how her discoveries went, you know, from probably the medical world and into the whole mind body space. And I'll let her tell you the story, uh, but she really wanted to share the, the, the knowledge and the possibility that people who have been told you've got long COVID, <laughs> you can actually get better. So Rachel, thank you so much for uh, volunteering to tell this story and uh, I'll let you take it from here. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Dan. Um, so I don't know, do you want, I guess, I guess, well, starting from I got COVID in December 2020. Sure. Um, so towards the, um, yeah, a few months into the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. And it was quite mild at the time. I laugh now because at the time my greatest fear was the fact that um, my daughter had it and uh, was at school and therefore we had to isolate our whole school. So actually the, the real kind of worry was the fact that I was that parent that had to then, you know, um, mean that the uh, the whole class was isolated and then all the different families over Christmas all got COVID. Um, but actually it was quite mild. It wasn't the big thing that they'd reported in the newspapers. Um, sure. I recovered. <laughs> So I thought, <laughs> and yep. I think this is quite a normal, um, I've, you know, I've been on the long COVID site since I've recovered. And I think my story is quite similar to a lot of people where I recovered, it was Christmas time, I celebrated, I got out, I started running again, I was training for a marathon. So I started running, I started cycling again, everything was going great. And then I started realising that I was sleeping a lot. <laughs> And I was quite fatigued and my brain felt really foggy. And then I think, I don't know, somewhere 5th of January, 6th of January, I suddenly realised I couldn't really think. And I was just sleeping long hours and I was trying, and then I went back to work and I could just barely function and I run workshops on, um, on Zoom. And I don't know how I did it, to be honest, because um, I just felt like I wasn't there. <laughs> Right. Um, and this went on for about two months where I would have so much fatigue that I'd have to sleep. Um, and I think they call it the boom and bust cycles where I'd feel dreadful for days. Then I'd quit work for a few days, feel a bit better, um, then go back to work, <laughs> go back to normality and feel absolutely dreadful. And I had these kind of big cycles of boom and bust. Every 10 right. days were great, 10 days weren't. And then at some point mid-February, I think I just call it bust. <laughs> I just hit this brick wall where I just couldn't seem to, to function at all. Right. Um, okay. So I think, which I think is quite a normal, um, you know, you get some people that are hospitalized and were really ill with COVID. Mine wasn't that. Mine was the kind of milder version, but somehow um, my whole system just crashed and I just couldn't seem to to function so that was sure. mid-February um yeah and then and then and then I think I became aware it was quite interesting because you get these kind of touch points where you start to work out what's going on and I did lots of research was it my mitochondria someone said it was ME I went on some fatigue course which actually was probably the worst thing I could have done because they told me that I was exercise intolerant shouldn't be drinking shouldn't go out should rest should pace all of these things which in retrospect probably probably drove the illness um and then yeah, scared you more put more fear in you put more fear in me and you know you, you look back afterwards and you go when was it that it was no longer about exercise and your nervous system when was it about fear and actually looking back perhaps it was earlier than I thought but even when I stopped everything I still couldn't seem to function um, and then I became aware at sort of the end of February when I was trying to make the decision whether to work or not or take time off or not. Right. Actually, the, 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 the trying to make the decision was actually the thing that was really stressing me. And I phoned my mum and I said, it's really funny. Whenever I quit work for a couple of months, a couple of weeks, I feel all right. And then when I go back to work, I feel dreadful. Isn't that weird? And then we both stopped and did a double take and went, oh, there's something that's happening from a kind of stress 
emotional, cognitive, worry perspective that is going on. And so I actually took the time, I took the decision to take six weeks off. And I thought I was doing it to rest because everyone had said rest, you know, stay in the house, don't do anything. That's the way to recover. But actually on reflection, I think it was giving myself a chance just to de-stress and right. to start to work out what was going on. Um, which and at that point I discovered things like the Gupta program. And uh, that was really helpful because he started talking. It wasn't perfect, but he started talking about the nervous system and being in fight or flight and some of the worries. Um, and I realized that I thought it was permanent. And I don't know why, because no one told me that, apart from that I'd gone into these different Facebook groups and everyone was saying it was permanent. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, they told you that. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, and um, as soon as you think it's permanent, I used to ring my mum and go, I just want my old life back. <laughs> Why can't I just have my old life back? Um, and she went, well, you, you can't right now. <laughs> right. Um, and absolutely just felt like I was in this pit where I just couldn't seem to get out of it. But the, yeah, the Gupta program. And then I listened to Nicole Sachs and I'd never heard of TMS. And I um, she talked about something called pre-grieving. Um, and I thought that was really fascinating that actually what was happening is the worry of coming closer to an event that I felt that I had to perform that I had to be well. She suggested that actually that was driving. It wasn't the overdoing things. It was the worry about the overdoing things that started to become the condition. Um, yeah, so that's that, was, right? that was fascinating to me that I actually then realized that I therefore had some influence in what was going on. Um, mm -hmm. so 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 that was a key key moment I remember sitting outside in the garden it was about sometime mid-march and, and ringing my mum and just going I think I've got some influence whereas prior to that I just thought these crashes just happened I thought there was nothing I could do and when I was in a crash I remember writing on a Facebook group what happens when you're in a crash how do you what do you then do and someone went when I'm about to crash I retreat to bed and I sit in a dark room and I do absolutely nothing so Prior to that, I thought that that was the solution. And suddenly there was this different way and it didn't solve everything, but it made me realize that there was some things that I could uh, do. Right. I do cool. have a tendency to talk, by the way, so do kind of interrupt. and. No, no, no it's quite all right. Um, I'm letting you share your story. That's what this is all about. Share yeah. your journey. So what happened? what happened once you started to see that you had some influence? Um, so um, I think I think there was there was that which was the the kind of um, I think I did some Reiki or something and I felt really tired afterwards and I thought oh no it's happening again I'm having this kind of relapse and I started to realize that I was frightened of tired um, so that was also a key moment um, that um, um, yeah, I, I, you know, and then you start to realize actually that you sort of hang on to these first initial symptoms. And, and then you worry about the symptoms and then, you know, you end up then kind of in this kind of impending um, sort of doom. So, so, so that happens. Um, and I think at the same time, I read a book that was really significant. And it was a lady called Catherine May and it was called The Wintering. And she starts off by talking about um, her being really ill. Um, but actually the book then starts to go off on different tangents. Um, but the bit that I sort of picked up was that actually this was just a phase and and there was a reason behind it. And I started to realise that this wasn't just about COVID. This was about a chance to reshape my life somehow. And that actually what had happened was the year before COVID was so stressful um, from a work perspective, from the way that I manage my emotions, from um, um, my relationships with um uh, a now ex-partner um, and how I kind of managed stress and viewed stress and the fact that I felt like I had to be busy and superwoman and I'm a single parent and all of these things actually I started to realize had also fed in and so I think there was a kind of acceptance and a realization that I needed to enjoy the six weeks that I'd taken off um, and then the mind shift changed because I decided to learn my way out of it um, right. I bought a hot tub 
<laughs> um, and sat in my garden, I know, mm. for six weeks, oh. <laughs> reading everything I could in terms of mind body and listening to different podcasts and starting to um, slowly kind of emerge. So um, I think that that was uh, that was interesting. Um, I think also at one point I was so ill, I was great. Like it's definitely physical. You know, my toes were so swollen. I had Raynards. I was gray. My throat felt like I was being strangled. My back would feel like it was burning. Um, and um, I thought I'm going to just go and live with my parents and let them look after me. But then right. I realized I couldn't get to the train station because I, I didn't have enough energy. So I didn't do that. But actually, that was really good. So I somehow managed to outsource everything, get my um, friends to take my daughter to school. We lived off Deliveroo. Um, I went to bed when she went to bed. But somehow, because I had some purpose and some kind of need to have still some structure of getting her up in the morning, that mm -hmm. helped because there was a bit of a marker then in terms of realising that over the weeks, I was getting slightly better. Right. Um, so I think that was really helpful um, because it then meant that I could then tell myself I was getting better and that kind of constant yeah. telling myself that it wasn't perfect and I would kind of still cycle, mm -hmm. but over the weeks, what I was doing um, was definitely kind of on the up. So I think that that was a, a really useful um, useful thing to, um, to, to kind of notice. Um, I'm trying to think what other things then happened at the time. I still thought I was exercise intolerant. I don't know. I don't even know who told me that or why I believed that. Um, sure. <laughs> like at one point I went to the supermarket and I was convinced that going to the supermarket would make me crash. Um, and I don't know why I thought that. <laughs> just fear. It's just fear. The brain just goes, oh, no. Yeah what if and the doubts come in but then I started to realize that I was okay in the house and I could actually do quite a few thousand steps in the house but if I went outside so there was one significant piece where I walked for a mile very slowly but I thought I um I didn't intend to walk quite that far <laughs> and then I had a dip and the fatigue and this weird sensation that I thought was a symptom that I now recognize was anxiety I now right. recognize, or more than anxiety, I now recognize it as absolute fear. <laughs> um, but and so something didn't add up there because I was all right in the house, but not out the house. <laughs> right. um, and then another time I tried to cycle and I thought, right, I'm going to try and cycle. And I cycled for 10 minutes on the flats, didn't get my heart rate above 70 because they told you to reduce your heart rate. Um, and I was fine and I was fine for 24 hours. And then I crashed the next day. Um, and I now realize that that was me looking for symptoms. There was enough. Yeah. Out. When's the crash coming? When's the crash coming? When You're looking around for it. You expect it. Yeah, absolutely. And also looking back, my partner at the time said, you're worrying. And I said, no, I'm not. He said, I can see that you're worrying. And I kind of poo-pooed him. But actually now, again, looking back, I mean, he could have maybe said it in a different way, but looking back, actually, he was able to see through my physiology, some of mm -hmm. the scanning, some of this worrying, some of the fear that I mm -hmm. actually in myself wasn't aware of because I was so convinced that I was exercise intolerant and that I had so much energy and I'd been exposed to the spoon theory and someone had sent me these videos from an ME, you know, um, uh, centre um, who were telling me that I need that uh, the burning back was uh, laxic acidosis and, you know, that the energy was about mitochondria. I'd happened to have done a degree in biochemistry. So I kind of read, um, I think her name's uh, Dr. Sarah May Mayhill, Myhill's book, um, and started to be convinced that maybe there was something wrong with me. So you've got this kind of, I can't, on my good days, I believed that it was fight or flight and it was about getting out of that and then gradually reintroducing. But then every now and again, I'd get pulled back by some biomedical sure. thing that, that just kept pulling me back. Um, right. Which now seems ridiculous. <laughs> so I feel like I'm quite intelligent and, you know, so, you're in it. Yeah. So where did you turn the corner and get away from this? Um, uh, 
I'll say managing and watching of your symptoms and responding to the symptoms and trying to figure out, well, based on how I'm feeling, here's what I can or cannot do. And that, when did you, when did you go from that paradigm to uh, understanding a little bit better that doing more is means you'll be capable of more, not doing less. Yeah, so I think I think there are a couple of things. One is that I was determined to go back to work because that's my identity. It gives me purpose. I started to realise that actually just hanging around, I couldn't do that for forever. And if I was going to get well, I had to try and do something work related. So I did a two hour. Um, I facilitated a two hour session towards the end of April, and two days before that, having been okay for a few weeks, I crashed. And then I decided, so I remember ringing my mum going, maybe I should take six months off. Um, <laughs> and then I decided that actually I was going to do it anyway. And what was the worst that could happen? Um, and so I did it in an awful state, but I know my stuff. So I somehow got, got through it. Um, and uh, at the end of it, I felt better. And that was another key thing where I suddenly went, hang on a minute. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> on there? I can do that. So I actually slowly built in work um and I still was convinced that I couldn't exercise so that was the kind of Achilles heel I realized that I could gradually increase my walking gradually increase my work gradually I'd start bringing friends around but only for an hour I told them that after an hour I was going to be exhausted and so lo and behold (laughs) I would be exhausted yeah that's called that's called predictive coding yeah, I don't know if yeah. I'm familiar with that term, but for anybody watching, predictive coding means that if you expect something, your brain can literally create it out of thin air. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, actually looking back, even in December, I now realize that the first ever symptom I had when I realized I had COVID was fear, was that absolute primeval fear that I've actually felt once before in a scuba diving accident about 15 years before where I thought I was going to die. But I don't, I don't know. So I did recognize it, but I didn't put two and two together. Um, and I wonder now whether I'd read articles and I'd read about COVID and people recovering and then, you know, not recovering and going through these cycles. Um, so I wonder now whether actually that predictive coding may have actually been even earlier than, yeah. I, than, I, than I at the time realized. Um and I think in May, I someone I'd someone told me that they'd done something called the Lightning Process, right? Um, which is a brain retraining program, and um, quite controversial. You know, people either say they've recovered or they say that it made them worse, which again is probably predictive coding and beliefs and all sorts of expectations. Yeah, who knows the impact of the mind body on the uh, all of these programs? Yeah. Um, But for me, I think the big thing was that once I booked it, I booked it on the Friday to do on the Monday. I think I made the decision that I was going to be well. I can't I don't even know that it was a conscious decision. But looking back, I think I I think I'd made that decision. And on the Monday before I did the course, I got on my bike for 30 minutes on a treadmill um, and got my heart rate to 180. I thought if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it with the kind of safe in the knowledge that I've got three days of program with a coach that says that this can really work. So I'm going right. to really just go for broke and just just try it out, which I think when you're kind of heat, you have to do a little bit of that, don't you? The pushing of the boundaries yeah. in order to, to get better. And I had the worst anxiety 24 hours later that I've ever had in my life. Um, well, your brain was panicking. Like, what were you thinking? Uh, yeah. Like, Rachel, why did you do that yesterday? Well, exactly. But I think also what you said about the expectation um, effect, I think I was watching for it because for some reason, everyone said that if you're exercise intolerant, you probably won't notice it until 24 hours later. Um, I think they call it post-exertional malaise. So I, I was I was watching for it. I was expecting it. But I think also I knew that if I could get over it, that was going to be my ticket out, that mm-hmm. if I could work out a way of actually getting past that and not crashing then I was then going to give myself proof that therefore all the other things couldn't quite be right um so um yes and actually then I did the program and I was so so convinced I was then well I I suddenly was like I'm well 
I'm absolutely well. I don't need any more support. It's all great. I'm going to go for a run. Um, I'm right. going to go and cycle. I'm going to get back my life. And so I did that for about a week and a half. And then <laughs> I felt the familiar fatigue. I, I, in fact, I shared my story on a Facebook group because I was so happy that I'd recovered and I wanted to tell everybody else. And then I got the familiar fatigue. I think I'd seen my parents because it was the end of the pandemic. So I was quite overwhelmed. Um, and then once you get that familiar fatigue and someone on a Facebook group had said, it's early days, Rachel. We'll believe it when we see it. Watch out for the impending crash. Um, and <laughs> Hey, thanks for making me crash. <laughs> exactly. That nearly toppled me. And I had to really fight to get out of that because, you know. That, that's actually called a nocebo. It's the opposite of a placebo. Placebo is doing something, believing it will make you well. A yeah. nocebo is somebody saying, oh, you're going to crash. It's it's a negative belief system that actually brings it upon, just like a placebo is a positive belief system. This sugar pill is going to cure my headache, and yeah. it often does. So your friend or whomever that was in the group gave you a big nocebo. Yeah. Said, yeah, you're going to crash. And sure enough, you expected it then. And your brain said, here you go. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So then I was like, it hasn't worked. Everything people are saying is true. Maybe it is a biomedical thing. Maybe, you know, maybe I've got it wrong again. Maybe I do need to pace. Maybe it is about energy. And then I made a phone call to the coach who'd done the lightning process with me. And I said, this hasn't worked. I've got it wrong. <laughs> You've got it wrong. And she went, where are those beliefs, Rachel? And luckily, I'd done quite a lot of NLP training um, and I started to work out that, you know, it, it got into my psyche. I primed myself all over again to, yeah, I didn't think of it as, as a nocebo, but I, I essentially that's what I'd done is, is I re-triggered my nervous system. I got back into fear mode. Um, so I got out of that. <laughs> had a good couple of months doing really well. And then a few, yeah, maybe December 2021, I was I went back on the groups. So I started blogging. I started sharing my story. I definitely helped people. I went back on the groups. I started talking to a lot of people, doing some videos, doing some interviews. December 2021, I'd got quite a lot of work stress, um, lots of stress for the house. Woke up one day with brain fog. Someone had been talking on the groups about brain fog. Um, and somehow I got myself into this worry cycle. Looking back, it was probably just I'd woken up in a sleep cycle and I was a bit stressed, but it's, then I just couldn't seem to get rid of it. And the more I tried to get rid of it, the more it was there. And I spent weeks then trying to fight this brain fog, constantly obsessed with it, constantly reading as to what it could be. And suddenly I'm back in the same cycle where I'm sleeping more, I'm doing exercise, but then I'm kind of at the end having to go and sleep for a few hours. Um, and then the worst anxiety I have ever had and proper full on right. panic attacks. Um, and recently I read Alan Gordon's book, The Way Out. And he talked about the fact that when you're healing, um, I can't think what he calls it, you might know, but it's like you're, it's almost like the symptoms have to get worse because I, I thought of it, I think of it now as maybe it's my nervous system going, are you really sure? Are you absolutely sure? And trying to get my attention. And then when they're not getting my attention, they just ramp up somehow. So I had the absolute worst anxiety and panic that I've ever had. Um, and I um, came across a book by a lady called Nicola Bird called A Little Peace of Mind. Okay. Um, and um, for some reason it resonated. And she talked about your thoughts, uh, your thoughts just come. You can't really control them. They just come. But imagine that they're on this sort of ticker tape um, and you don't have to buy into them. You don't have to give them meaning. You just can sort of sit back and just observe them and notice them. And if you notice mm -hmm. them, but you don't, I mean, she called them Bob and she said, Bob's a homeless person that, you know, you might kind of give, you know, some food to or some money to, but you don't have to invite him in at three in the morning and give him a cup of tea and kind of properly, you know, accept that invitation. You can just right. kind of notice, observe, you know, ask yourself whether actually there's something else that you need to be doing and whether it's giving you a message in terms of changing your lifestyle. 
Um, and I just felt as I was reading this book that everything just, I don't know, for me, it's always about insights. It's not about mm-hmm. the techniques. It's just about these light bulb moments that just give you this insight that make you go, oh, okay, that's what I've been doing. I've been kind of accepting the invitation to go down these kind of rabbit hole <laughs> thought patterns um, yeah. with lots of research and lots of kind of focus. And actually, if I just notice and then carry on with my life, that's probably a better option. And it just phases. Yeah. Um, so one, one thing that I teach a lot is with regard to thinking, which is just what you said from that book, is we don't have to do anything with our thoughts. Yeah. We don't have to stop them. We don't have to fix them. But we also don't have to believe them or take them seriously. We can just notice them and watch them float by. Yeah. And when you do that, the more you do that, um, the lighter everything becomes because so much of the struggle and suffering that we have with symptoms and mental health doesn't come from the symptom itself. It comes from the thinking about the symptom. And when you're yeah. thinking about the symptom, you now have the fear and the sadness and the despair emotions that go along with the thinking. But if we start to just notice a thought and go, I'm not going to engage in that. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? The whole, isn't thing, it? the whole thing really settles down. So that's cool that that was a turning point for you. Yes. And I think I went skiing at some point it, during a panic attack. And actually, whilst I was skiing, I was all right. And then as soon as I finished, boom, back it is again. So you also realize that kind of re-engagement with things when you're not kind of focusing on it or you're giving yourself something else that's maybe cognitive enough that you're focused in a different place. Um, right. That that hugely helps. Um, so, so that, yeah, there's so many learnings. I had IBS actually, or some IBS symptoms a couple of months later. And I've had that for most of my life. Um, and people were like, oh, you've got to go on the fog map. You should be eliminating this. Don't eat after this time. It's, you know, it's be gluten, it'd be chilly. It'd be, um, and there's something about my journey of long COVID that made me go, maybe this is mind body as well. Um, so I did some hypnotherapy, looked at my stress levels, took myself off on a holiday, decided deliberately to eat everything. Um, and uh, I haven't had it since. Haven't haven't had it. I know. Listen to basically some- proved to yourself that IBS was purely a conditioned response, stress response, fear based about food and diets and eliminate certain things and only eat perfectly. And when you finally said, screw it, this is all just created in the brain, your stomach and your digestive tract returned to balance. And now yeah. you can eat whatever you want. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I did, I did take some painkillers actually for a week. And I think there's something about just stopping the pattern that can, can help. Cause then it meant that I didn't have quite so much pain. So I wasn't focused on it as much. So, so I do think that sometimes some pharmaceuticals can help if they break the pattern but yeah for for me that was definitely kind of mind body and again it just I think I then said to myself right hang on a minute this keeps happening in different formats what is it that I'm just not learning do you mean the Mm -hmm. the same you almost have the same Achilles heel again and again um just in different it just rears its head in different ways it's like hang on a minute what am I actually not learning in terms of my emotional response to things, in terms of the way that I let stress get to me, in terms of the way that I kind of view the world, um, that if I did that would actually mean that I could maybe, you know, live a kind of more healthy, healthy existence where I wouldn't keep having these um, sort of physical manifestations. So I think that was uh, a really helpful um, thing to happen. Um, And since then I've been pretty good. Right. So, so that was the the turning point. Um, I think it's interesting. There's so many myths about long COVID. There's so much narrative out there as to what it is um, and what scientists tell you. And people saying things like the other day, I was reading that people said you don't heal, you um, go into remission. I thought that was a really interesting belief. Well, I was like, well, I think I've healed because once you understand it, you feel like then you've got the tools where. Right. Even if you're off par, you can recognize it as just being off par right. and do something about it. So, um, so I haven't really studied the scientific aspect of this long COVID stuff. 
Um, but from the little bit I've paid attention to it, I'm not seeing a lot of science behind it as far as the actual cause, because by the way, it's not as if this long COVID uh, has one set of symptoms. Yeah. I mean, there are people with an infinite number of symptoms. Some people have 40 symptoms. Some people have fatigue, you know, and there's all sorts of variations of it. So yeah. how does this thing called COVID and the remaining implications of it cause hundreds of different, different symptoms for all these different people. Um, and I truly, be, at least my impression, I could be wrong. My impression is that um, the brain and the nervous system hit a tipping point. We start to experience certain symptoms. I call that a perceived danger response. Right. It's not always, it's yeah. not always yeah. conscious. So there are subconscious things. So we take all the life stuff that was going on along with the COVID, along with all of the fear that was going on globally with COVID. Now, all of a sudden, you get it and said, well, it wasn't so bad. And now, all of a sudden, um, you know, you start hearing about people being sick after they got better from COVID. And that creates more fear, more perceived danger. And the whole system just keeps on ratcheting up until you get a symptom. And then all of a sudden we go, oh no, what's that? And then the fear and the attention that we give to that symptom is yeah. what allows it to continue. And then we really get stuck in this, in this cycle of fear, symptom, fear, symptom, fear, symptom, resistance and all that stuff. And, um, you know, you found your way out through a wide variety of resources. You kept on reading, kept on digging, taking little bits from here, little bits from there. And it's really cool that you came to the same conclusion um, that many of the folks in my community come to, which is, holy crap, I'm really not broken. Yeah, There's absolutely. Wrong with me. Yeah, I actually worked within the NHS and there was a, um, a surgeon, he was talking about chronic pain. This was This was also really useful where he said, when you break an ankle, for instance, and then it's healed, it's really common for then you still to get the same pain for years. And it, again, it's your nervous system that frightens that once you've done something once that's hurt you, that it's going to happen again. And I thought, actually, that's really similar, isn't it? But somehow it's easier to visualise when it's something that physically has happened, whereas when it's something like COVID, it's kind of harder to maybe mm -hmm. be the wood for the tree. So I actually think the chronic pain um, kind of community and all the thinking in terms of TMS it, it's so much better in the pain kind of world than it is maybe in the fatigue world. So certainly that's where I seem to find the answers to yeah. help me in terms of um, in terms the of the TMS pain. world is where you found the answers. Absolutely. And there was a, there was a podcast that Nicole Sachs did called the symptom imperative. Mm -hmm. um, and that really kind of sold to me that this was neuroplastic because the symptoms kept changing. Um, and, and they would sometimes be worse, sometimes be better and they would move around. And that to me is like, well, that can't be permanent then. That can't be permanent damage. That's got to be something else because everyone's got a different signature, but then everyone's really interested in the amount of times they get asked, what were your symptoms? And you know that if you say the same symptoms as someone else, they'll believe you. Whereas if you say, you know, my symptoms were this and they go, but you didn't have pops you didn't have a high heart rate that they're not gonna take what you say whereas the reality is everyone's everyone somehow focuses on different things and then the more you focus on the more you get so even now when I get anxious I still get the tight throat but it's kind of all right because I know I just go oh there's the tight throat I'm feeling anxious um but it's obviously still wired or or I'm still I don't know what that's I don't know if you know what that's about um I, I never had it before long COVID, but I still, I feel like someone's slightly strangling me. Um, so I don't know. Oh, and tell me about the, the question, say the question again. So, so even now, one of, one of my symptoms when I had long COVID and if I was heading into a crash would be that I would feel like um, someone was strangling me. It, it would feel like this. Mm -hmm. um, and even now, if I, if I'm feeling stressed and feeling anxious, I notice that I still get a tightening of the throat. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether that's just a neuroplastic, uh, 
the sort of um, what's the expression? They talk about nerves that are wired together, or nerves that are fired together get wired together. And once you yeah. kind of have this association, the same association happens. I don't know. Uh, I, it could be, possibly, um, or it could simply be as you're getting stress, worked up over things, tension is a natural response. Um, why did I get back pain while some other people get neck pain, yeah. some other people get headaches? Um, it's not neuroplastic until it's happened a bunch of times. But the brain can always turn on a symptom, yeah. a new one, uh, when it perceives danger. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to figure out the mechanism in the body, the brain wiring stuff. Um, I don't believe we need to understand any of the how biomechanically it happens. I think we just focus on the fact that, oh, when I get stressed, I get this sensation, but I know I'm okay. So I'm not going to give it a lot of fear or attention. I'm not going to show this much concern and I know it will fade away. Yeah. So I jump right to the solution, which is always, you know, a calm response always wins compared to, I need to figure out if this is neuroplastic yeah. or if it's something else, or is it long COVID or is it TMS or and, and, you know, you can spend weeks, months, years trying to figure stuff out, but that doesn't necessarily get you any closer to the solution, which is purely, I'm actually okay. Yeah. Okay. And how do I convince my subconscious brain that I'm okay? Well, it's not going to happen by researching long COVID uh, Facebook groups and, you know, yeah, it's Reddit channels and all that stuff. We don't, we don't have to talk to everybody who's like, in desperation to get better because all that's going to do is scare the crap out of us. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, now, I mean, that, that actually, I took your advice in terms of, you said, just being different to things, maybe notice them, maybe be curious, but mostly just being different and don't attach one thing to, to mm -hmm. another. Um, so, I, so I think I'm, I'm fine in terms of that, but I do go back on some of these groups just to share my blog every now and again. Um, and there's so much one person will say, well, I ate this thing and that caused me to crash. And then someone else says the same thing. And before you know it, you know, it's you're afraid of eating that same thing. Oh, and so you've got people that are literally eating breads and rice, and that's all they can eat because they're actually convinced that anything else, you know, would would uh, yeah. make them 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 crash, um, or yeah. that they can only do one task a day, and that it's about energy. Whereas actually, I, I I've realised it was never about energy. It was always about fight or flight and being in a kind of fear mode and getting caught mm -hmm. in the panic and i think i realized also that i've never seen myself as someone that's anxious prior to um long covid yeah. but when i've now drilled back i've realized that actually i thought it was just in my work particularly i thought that i'd be preempting everything and that was actually being really good at planning and you know anticipating i now realize that actually i've probably been quite high functioning anxious for lots of years but just not really seen it as that. And actually having COVID and then managing to trigger my nervous system actually helped because it's made me go back and actually reevaluate lots of things in my life um, sure. prior to COVID. I mean, my best friend said, Rachel, we always wondered when you'd burn out. Because <laughs> you seem to be just this superwoman that was just yeah. maxing out and trying to prove to the world that you could do everything. Um, yeah, but it, it wasn't necessarily that you wore yourself out. It was just you had a whole series of things come together at once that just kind of overflowed the bucket, so yeah. to speak. And then you got sucked into the vortex of fear focus, frustration, worry. Um, I like to say, as it relates to um, trying to figure out what's going on and going into these groups specific for symptoms, stay out of the bad neighborhoods. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Stay out of the bad neighborhoods because flat out, if you're going into a group that is designed for people to get together, inevitably, they are going to be talking about the worst case yep. scenarios and the people who got better are not in the group. They're not coming back. So the positive stuff's not being shared. And the people who come in and go, did you know this is a mind-body thing? They oftentimes, not always, oftentimes get attacked. Yeah. I have something real going on. Yes, it was yeah. the 
yes, it was the rice cake that sent me into a flare. Or perhaps it was the fear. It was the perceived danger. Um, the other thing I'll just say about fatigue, mm-hmm. um, it's always the brain, in my opinion. Uh, not to say that our mitochondria and our bodies and the energy and the hydration. Yes, there's a biomechanical system that's absolutely at play. But if fatigue can turn on and turn off like like a light switch sometimes, I don't think that's biology. I think that's pretty much the brain going, time out. Life is too intense. Go take a nap. Yeah, it was really interesting. I was sat on this chair and I did the lightning process back in May. And I said, but don't I need to pace? And the lady who was running the course went, Rachel, you have as much energy as anyone else. And I went, but I've been told to pace. I mean, she said, that don't be ridiculous almost. She didn't say it quite like that, but that's what I took. And she went, you are just, you're just kind of, you keep flicking the switch. You're holding yourself in this kind of state of being in absolute fear. And that's the thing that's caused, you know, setting in motion the things that eventually create fatigue. But it's not about spoons. It's not about counting things. It's not about trying to work out what things are going to, you know, take away your energy. It's purely a kind of, stress response that's then kind of triggering everything and just in that moment I went oh my gosh I'm better I've always been well like I've been well for a while actually it's just that I've been thinking that I'm ill and so I've been operating in a place where yeah if I don't know if you're behaving like you're someone that's ill then you end up kind of getting the thing maybe that you're um your your um you, you yeah you create that don't you whereas if you're coming from a place of being 100 percent and healthy um but someone that can have off days and on days you get a very different um experience of yeah that. so so one of the things i often point out is that uh your brain and nervous system is working perfectly it's just operating on misinformation yeah dead data and fear and the misinformation could be a lot of what we learn in all of these other forums and these other programs that don't really factor in the brain and their perception of danger into the equation. Because in those groups, it is all about pacing. It is all about, um, you know, proper foods and uh, managing your mitochondria. And they probably, I don't know, they get lost in the weeds when if you step back, it's all green and pretty. Yep. But when you start getting that close, you're going to find, I don't know, bad, an- bad analogy, but you get the point. Yeah, we focus on the little tiny micromanagement of our human system when, in fact, if we just teach the brain, the subconscious that, hey, we're okay already, and we remove the fear, we remove the worry, we remove the projection that this is going to be the rest of my life, Yeah, everything just returns to balance. This whole hormonal system, stress response system fear the perceived danger comes down because it's like holy crap i'm okay and everything really gets better fairly quick so is there anything else you wanted to share with the audience here uh specific to your journey whether it be this you know concept of long COVID or not um i don't want to ask a definitive statement like do you believe long COVID is a real thing I think there are people who may have ended up with some heart or lung issues, um, but those should be, you know, seeable on blood tests, image studies, you know, on actual tests. But for many of the people with this long COVID, their tests are all clear. Yeah. And they're just coming up with that term based on, well, you had COVID, now you got a whole bunch of symptoms, so it must be long COVID. And I think, you know, if it's not really based on, something provable medically or biologically um, folks should really take a hard look at whether or not the brain and this concept that I introduced called perceived danger, which is also referred to as TMS, but it's brain created symptoms based on the brain saying, Oh crap, we got a problem. And symptoms are the warning signal. Yeah. So I think if, if your heart and lungs are checking out fine, but you're just dealing with a wide variety of symptoms and you're being told you've got long COVID and it's forever, don't buy it. Don't yeah. accept that explanation because if the brain's creating it, the, the brain can turn it off as well. 
Yeah, I don't even know now. No one said to me it was forever. But I became absolutely convinced. At my worst, I felt suicidal. I wanted my old life back. I didn't seem to have my old life. I couldn't work out how to crawl out of this pit. That's what it felt like. It felt like I kept going back into this dark mm -hmm. pit. And no one told me it was forever. It was, you know, the whole thing lasted maybe a year in total, you know, by the time I'd kind of got out and had some wobbles. But for some yeah. reason, I convinced myself that it was for forever and that I was destroyed and that I'd screwed my life up and all these kind of really dark thoughts. So I don't know, you know, where, where that even came from, because once you're out of it, looking back in, you can see it for what it is. Yeah. So, um, But did you catch what you just said? that I screwed my life up, yeah. which meant there was a certain amount of guilt, shame, yeah. and belief that I did this to myself. Yes. Like I brought this on by pushing too hard and doing too much and everything else. Like in those things that maybe people said, when are you going to crash? You're like superwoman. You're doing too much. You're always go, go, go. And so, no, you didn't do this to yourself. None of this was your fault. Yeah. None of it. Yeah. It's where you ended up, but none of this is your fault. Just like with anybody else dealing with TMS or what I call perceived danger and what other people call, you know, nervous system di dysregulation and stress induced illness. None of it's your fault. Yeah. It's just yeah. where we end up. And that's okay because once we recognize what's going on and that we're actually okay, guess what? We can teach the brain that we're okay. And when the brain gets a message, it returns to balance and things settle down. So yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah, I, th I think my big lesson was, well, I, I very early on, someone gave me a number of someone that I hadn't met, but they texted me to say they'd recovered. So I had this one person that had recovered from long COVID. And I have to say that made such a difference in a world where I thought it was permanent and no one ever recovered um, to know that there was this one person that I could text that was the other side. Mm -hmm. So I guess my advice for anyone that's in it is to find someone that's recovered you know, don't stay in the groups that are all the people that are ill. You know, don't right. start looking at people's individual symptoms because everyone's got a different signature anyway. Um, right. But, and, and don't, you know, people have doubted me. I've had people saying, well, you can't have been as ill. You must have had a different long COVID than me. Whereas actually, if you can look at people that recovered and, and look for the trends, like what things have they done that have actually made a difference? And then start writing down what are the things that I can do, even if it's small, Having a routine sure. in the morning, you know, meditation helps. I saw a breathing physio because I was hyperventilating because I was in so much fear. So I started doing breathing exercises. I started sitting outside in my garden. I started doing some yoga, building up slowly. So I guess it's looking at the trends of what have people that have recovered done rather right. than looking at what people haven't. And also looking at what people say. So my partner said to me, I think you should be more positive. And to be honest, I nearly hit him at the time. Um, but, you know, because that's not probably the most helpful. But actually, if you can take away, if you can look at what people are saying to you, and even if you don't like the way they're saying it, you know, maybe they're saying you're worried, maybe they're saying you're anxious, rather right. than kind of getting defensive, actually look for, are there some nuggets in what other people are seeing in terms sure. of your blind spots that might help you in terms of finding a way out i think i think that would be my my key message listen to awesome. people that have recovered and listen to success stories that i know are posted on your um your yeah i've i've got at least one long covid success story this will be another one um i've gotten a couple of text based ones like people would write it to me um it just it just fits perfectly and i haven't really seen the true medical evidence of it so that's my story i'm sticking to it um, uh, I'm, I'm with right. you I'm with you yeah so you're proof so listen I really appreciate you volunteering to come in and tell your story uh, I'm sure this will help many people um, the key message that I'll wrap it up with is uh, for anybody who's been told you've got this long COVID and um, there's as many symptoms as there are recommendations for curing it at the end of the day, long COVID doesn't mean you're broken or sick or ill or damaged or diseased. It means your brain and nervous system got scared. The perception of danger is what turned on symptoms. The fear and the focus and the attention is what has kept the symptoms going. And it's our job to say, holy cow, I'm actually okay. So that the fear can dissipate. And when the fear dissipates, we'll pay less attention 
And when that happens, the symptoms can start fading away one at a time. And if they return, it doesn't mean you're sick again. It just means that the brain perceived danger again, symptoms show up. And so for anybody on this journey, that's what's going on. Um, I truly believe you can get well. I've seen it now a number of times. I've heard other anecdotal stories from other people in the whole mind body space. Um, it's not a life sentence to feeling crappy. Yeah. Can I just say I ran the London Marathon last month as well. So really to because I wanted to do it because I could, but also just to prove that I'm not exercise intolerant. <laughs> that I, is extremely months. inspiring. Yeah. So I hope people stuck around for the end of the co- end, end of this video because that is incredible. So from long co- I may even put that in the title from yeah, long yeah. COVID to London Marathon. Yeah. I think yeah. that is a is a headline. So. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Listen, yeah. Rachel, congratulations. I'm thrilled you shared this story. Um, give it a few days. Watch my channel. It should post probably sometime later this week. And uh, you'll see it post. And if you want to engage in people as they're leaving comments, feel free. You'll see it on YouTube and on my Facebook community. Brilliant. And where do I email? I'll email you the blog if you if you like. It's just got various um, articles. Yeah, you can just story. email Dan at painfreeu. Brilliant. Dan at painfreeu.com. What? Dot com. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank I you. appreciate you. And uh, I'm going to hit stop on the recording. But thank you again, Rachel.